proud supporters of Africa this week. Engine, with us, you are number one. Reports out of Nigeria say Nigerian President Goodluck Jonathan will send a constitutional amendment bill to Parliament aimed at changing the presidential and state governorship tenures to longer single term. We spoke to Opoyemi Agbaje, CEO of Resource and Trust. What we hear is that the president proposes to increase the terms for governors and the president to perhaps six or seven years uh, and they would be constitutionally barred from 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 take going for a second time after that the president spokesman says uh, such a such an amendment will take effect from 2015 after the current tenures of all the occupants of those offices and that the president does not intend to be a beneficiary of the new uh, proposed um, amendment that's what do, all we know for now. What do you make of the sanity of the proposal? Because the argument is, you know, a country as vast as Nigeria, with so many pressing social and developmental issues, you know, four years in power is just insufficient. Well, um, frankly, I, I don't support the logic behind the proposed amendment. First of all, I find it a bit bewildering that this would be the first initiative of the president, having taken office, in terms of legislative agenda, I, I couldn't possibly conceive how this becomes the country's number one priority. Beyond that, um, I think the logic of the proposal is a bit simplistic, if not shallow. Um, the fact that you're going to do a six or seven year tenure is presumed in the logic to, to reduce the, 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 the fierceness of political competition. I don't think the evidence supports such a view. Um, we had very fierce and very violent or tumultuous governorship elections in the last election, even though the incumbents were not running. Several incumbents, I mean, usually have a successor in mind who they want to get into office by all means. I don't see how the mere fact that an individual is not contesting eliminates the fierceness of such competition. Indeed, the prospect of being out of power for six or seven years yeah. can in increase even the, 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 the desperation of uh, aspirants to win those elections and can actually cause uh, more chaos into the system. Facing the challenge of doing business in Africa is a theme for this year's international tax conference held in South Africa this week. Afsa Ibrahim, a partner at BDO Mauritius, explained the relationship between tax and doing business in Africa. Well, Africa is going through interesting phases and uh, for once when we talk about Africa we are talking about economic growth, we are talking about yeah. investments, we are talking about uh, foreign investors looking at Africa with a totally different outlook compared to 15 years ago. And uh, every country has got its own challenge, and Africa is not one country, it's 54 countries. Yeah. So every country has got its own challenges. So each one is putting up its uh, fiscal regime according to its best interests. Mm. But then you're having more and more players going towards the international trade, regional trade, regional investments, and money is flowing from everywhere. So international taxation is becoming a key competitive edge mm. in attracting investments across Africa. What would make an African economy, and any economy for that matter, stand out as a wonderful investment destination on the basis of its fiscal and tax regimes? I think first and foremost it would be the ease of doing business, would be the, the one which got a big tick. Um, you know, very clear rules, rules are not changing, and um, clear policies that will not make any U-turn, and give the confidence that um, the government means business yeah. and investors friendly attitude the fiscal incentives comes at the secondary level and uh, the fiscal incentive just make the return on investment added higher but it should not be the reason why people would right. invest it's a combination of factors now given the fact that as you said Africa is not one homogenous block it's 54 countries with varying tax regimes there is one common denominator in Africa and that's poor tax systems poor tax base and the fact that often corporates and multinationals bear the burden of tax payments to a large extent when African governments say we're collecting tax revenues it's corporate taxes which could be anything within the region of 40 to 70 percent of earnings yeah what what we find is um, is the rules are not very clear and in some countries you have very clear rules 
but in practicalities, the rules are not applied. So investors get very confused as to what are the policies that are being applied. Because you are told these are the rules, but in reality, this is not how it works. And this is what creates a lot more uncertainties. And with the amount of money flowing in and the collection, sometimes taxation is seen as a, uh, as a penalty, mm. as opposed to a contribution to an economy for the profit I'm generating. Mm. More and more, some countries are using tax as a disincentive and thinking, you know, the more I tax them, uh, the better the, uh, the local people would benefit. Mm -hmm. In fact, what they should be doing is how best to link businesses, foreign investments, link to the local stakeholders. And there are various ways of uh, going about it as opposed to just having a very heavy penal uh, fiscal system. Investment in Tanzania's electricity sector will create expansion prospects for the greater economy. This is the view of Frost & Sullivan energy and power analyst Vincent Maposa. He explained. Well, the situation is a bit uh, difficult to judge at this moment. Uh, there are significant uh, efforts that are being made by both the Tanzanian government, Tanesco, and all other interested parties in sort of uh, uh, coming, with a, so coming up with a solution that will, be, that will provide long-term um, sort of a scenario where electricity is available to the key industries. Mm. What happened with Tanzania was a significant underinvestment in baseload power, which has left uh, basically the, the, the hydropower stations, which, are, which succumb to the, pre uh, the prevalent drought uh, situation mm. and uh, sort of uh, w with less capacity than expected. So so there's significant efforts that are being made by both the Tanzanian government and uh, other investors who are interested right. in investing in Tanzania in creating a situation where the Tanzania will always have a significant amount of base load power. Right. Now, in Tanzania in particular, um, the drivers of the economy, manufacturing, mining and tourism, how have those key sectors been affected by the power shortages we're seeing at the moment? Uh, obviously, there's stunted growth within the uh, mining and manufacturing sector due to the unavailability of power. What we have seen is mining sector participants engaging the government of Tanzania and uh, the Ministry of Energy and Minerals in an attempt to, uh, to create a situation where they can generate their own power and possibly sell some of the excess power to the national grid so as to, sort of, so as to power their, their operations in particular. Mm. This situation could be beneficial to the Tanzanian uh, economy, basically, in the sense that uh, the availability of power will obviously have a rollover effect on uh, sectors such as tourism, agriculture mm. and uh, finance. Uh, the costs to the economy, as you're saying, have not been fully quantified, but um, there are opportunities, and particularly opportunities for emergency power generators. Have they come to the party? Um, as of June uh, to 2011, uh, the Tanzanian government flighted uh, adverts uh, for a bidding process for about 260 megawatts of uh, emergency power. Some um, uh, emergency power producers, are, such as Agreco, which were already uh, uh, operating within Tanzania, have already stepped up efforts and have sort of uh, increased uh, their capacity. It's, uh, we, we haven't had any sort of uh, reports from Tanzania as to how far they have gone in getting to that 260 megawatt target for emergency power. But there are significant uh, opportunities and there's lots of news of several uh, emergency power uh, generators uh, going into the market. Mm. In Tanzania, obviously, with the economy picking up, it's starting to translate as dividends for the consumer, a growing middle class, uh, a more affluent rural community. That means electricity demand should peak. Um, can they cope, authorities, with the demand? Uh, presently, demand for electricity is growing at about 4.2% per annum, whilst obviously installed and available electricity capacity hasn't grown significantly in the last 20 or so years. Most of Tanzania's uh, power plants are quite old, over 20 years old, and there's significant underinvestment in transmission and distribution infrastructure. So what's happening is you obviously have the growing middle class, the growing uh, lower class, which is also demanding electricity at a, at a very high rate. So essentially, Tanzania needs to address the situation presently so as, to, uh, so as to come to a point where when demand uh, sort of peaks, which of course it hasn't at the stage because mm. it's still a growing economy, they have uh, s sustainable solutions that will provide power to, this, to the sectors that are most important and to the people that are able to afford it and are able to use it uh, to the best of their abilities.